well. Good morning. Welcome again. Uh, thank you, worship team, and for those of you that have been studying with us through the book of Romans, uh, and especially in light of the passage we're going to look at today, uh, each and every one of those songs that we sang today, this morning, uh, singing the truth uh, of the passage, and uh, God has set us free in Christ. And uh, I hope that as we sing, uh, you, you pause and have an opportunity to think of those words and reflect on what we're saying, what we're affirming. Uh, it's good to be with you. Uh, yesterday, I was not feeling very well, and today, it's my voice mostly. Uh, so, I will do my very best to uh, share with you what I've been working on this week last couple of weeks actually from uh, this passage uh, but before I do uh, your programs today were filled with all sorts of things one of the pages is the sermon notes for this morning and the other thing that is in there is uh, a voter guide and I just want to draw your attention to that uh, we as we as God's people have to uh, be informed uh, participants in what's going on in our culture. And uh, one of the uh, least <laughs> controversial ways, least risky ways to make a difference is to be an informed voter. Uh, I read this quote uh, a couple weeks ago and uh, I can't get it out of my mind uh, and part of that is in a situation that Janelle and I have found ourselves in. And uh, the quote is, and this is in regards to the Lutheran Church in Germany uh, at the time that Hitler was uh, sending millions of Jews to their death. And the quote is this, they are in their churches singing more and more loudly to drown out the cries of those in the boxcars heading to their gruesome deaths. Sing with us, they say, and don't worry about all those other issues out there. They don't concern us. Our job is to focus on God and pretend that we can do so without fighting for those he loves, whose lives and futures are being destroyed. And uh, I don't know how God is calling each of you to participate uh, we have so many in our church that God has involved in the political arena and in our uh, schools and uh, lots of places in our city. But all of us, all of us have an opportunity and privilege to uh, vote in ways that would, that would lead to God's principles uh, being followed. Uh, and maybe, maybe nothing will change, but what's our responsibility there? So on that voter guide, uh, I know there's only information there for two candidates, but there is a QR code on there. And if you would go to that, you would be able to find information about all the issues and judges and candidates that uh, are in your precinct that you'll be voting for here in about just over a week. So uh, just encourage, implore you to uh, be an informed participant shape our culture. Also, as Greg alluded to, uh, next, next Sunday, November the 6th, I believe that is, uh, we will be having a family meeting at 6 and I invite all of you to come to that and uh, a large portion of that will be our elder panel discussion over our study of Romans. So that's a great place, a great uh, opportunity for you to come and uh, ask questions of your pastors and things that you in your study of Romans have, have uh, been, been wondering about, please come. Uh, we'll take a half hour, 45 minutes of that family meeting time to interact. And Marty Larson has agreed to, to moderate that again. And he'd, he's, he would be glad to take all your tough questions and then uh, reword them so that uh, they're nice and gentle, Marty. 
And, but anyway, please come next Sunday night at 6. Uh, and then next Sunday afternoon at 4, and you'll be receiving a reminder in email this week. Uh, but next Sunday afternoon at 4 o'clock, uh, the elders are inviting all of the members of our church to come for a time of prayer. Uh, as we've been praying through connection cards, as we've been praying with our staff and elders and deacons, uh, it has just come to our attention that there's just some amazing opportunities for us to, uh, to turn to God. To turn to God in praise and thanksgiving. Uh, this has been a season of people passing in our church. And that's been very difficult for many of our church families and the friends of those people. Uh, as we read through and pray through your connection card requests, we just realized that uh, as members of this church, as members who, who uh, have agreed with the church covenant to pray for one another, we want to give that opportunity next Sunday afternoon at 4 o'clock. And we will come right in here into this room and uh, we will pray through the ACTS acronym in small groups, adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and supplication. And uh, there will be an opportunity in those small groups in here for you to pray uh, over one of your fellow members. And then for you to be prayed for by your group also, if you wish. And uh, we have our booklets that we use to, to pray through for our members, and I hope many of you use those, but we'll pull those out again next Sunday afternoon and, and make those available to you. But I'm just going to ask you, please, if you're a member of this church, to, to come and pray. We're not going to uh, provide child care during that time. Uh, we will have it for the squirmers for our family meeting at 6. And so uh, uh, you, you can make those arrangements for your kids as you wish, uh, members. But come pray with us. We need to hold each other up in prayer. And it's a great privilege and it's our duty, our responsibility. Okay? Does that make sense? So you'll be reminded about that by email this week. So thank you so much for that. Uh, pull out your sermon notes, please, that are there with you. And uh, finally, finally, we get to leave the darkness of Romans chapters 1, 2, and the first part of 3. And uh, the pastors that have preached the last few weeks have, uh, have had difficult, discouraging uh, passages that have remind us, reminded us of our hopelessness and helplessness without God. And as they concluded most of their sermons, they tried to pull in something about God's good news, right? Well, today, that's the center of our attention. And I'm really thankful. I'm really thankful that this one fell on me. Uh, and so I'm excited about that. If you would, please, uh, one more time, would you stand? And I'm going to read through this passage, these few verses. And we just stand uh, in honor of God's word. And so if you would follow along with me, beginning in Romans chapter 3. In verse 21, but now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness because of his forbearance. He had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. And then you may be seated. pray with me father as we open up your word we invite your holy spirit to be our teacher today 
uh, Father, enable uh, my words to uh, be clear and my understanding of the passage to be right tonight, Father, uh, your spirit do the work that you need to do in our hearts today. Well, thank you in Christ's name. Amen. So as a means of introduction here, uh, let me just throw this out. Why did Jesus come into this world? And I just uh, paged through the book of Mark the other day and, and as I was thinking through this, and why did Jesus come here? Much of his life on this earth, he did a lot of, we would say, good things or nice things, right? Jesus healed people of their diseases. Jesus healed people of leprosy. Jesus did miracles and gave sight to the blind. Jesus took a paralyzed man and allowed him to walk. Jesus even rose by his command people from the dead back to life. Uh, Jesus created more matter and he took a few loaves and a few fish and fed 5,000 people. Those are good things. Those are nice things. He was helping people, right? He was meeting people's needs. Jesus was an amazing teacher. The crowds came to him because he was teaching like no other, and he would teach so creatively and powerfully with parables. And the truth that he was teaching was so captivating and at times so controversial that people couldn't stay away from him. And uh, as we were reading on Friday night at the detention center, it was a crowd of people that Zacchaeus tried to look over to find Jesus, right? Because there was something about his life and ministry that was interesting to people, that was captivating to people. He did all these amazing and wonderful things during his lifetime. But as we go through this passage, uh, we're going to find out really what his true mission was. Yes, people were hungry, they were blind. They wanted to hear some words from Jesus that would, would, were interesting. But the real need that people had is where we've been the last few weeks in Romans. All people are sinners. There is none righteous, no, not one. And all are under God's wrath. And we are reminded in scriptures that we are, we are to fear the one who can send us to hell. We're under God's wrath. And so all those other good things and nice things uh, demonstrated Christ's power and foreshadowed the, the reclaiming of his creation eventually. But when he came, and in a few a few weeks, several weeks, we'll be celebrating his birth. He came anticipating to be executed. Right? Isn't that amazing? He came anticipating that. That was his mission. So uh, on your notes, Point A, let's uh, just jump right into this in this first verse, verse 21. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. Hope is here. Uh, it's interesting right here at verse 21. But now, apart from the law, and we also get this little uh, a clue at the very end of this passage. I don't know if when you studied this, if you, if you caught this, but down in verse 26, it says this, he did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time. As Paul was writing this, he was living at a specific point of history when Jesus had come to this world to die for us. Okay, but now, apart from the law, so as we've been learning the last few weeks, 
the law could only get us so far. Okay? God has revealed his truth to us, his expectations in nature, who he is as our creator and our judge and God, and all we've discovered about ourselves over the last several weeks is we are guilty, 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 guilty. And this verse, apart from the law, we didn't need any more law. This is something different than the law, what Jesus has come to do. It's not more, more law, but it's very different. In the Old Testament writers, the Old Testament law and the Old Testament prophets looked ahead and gave us lots of clues to the Messiah who would come. And so here in this first verse, we just read that Paul was living in this moment in history where God eternal stepped into our world, into our calendar time frame, right? Like into, into this place at a certain time. And it's been told of for years and years and years and years, thousands of years it's been told of. And now in this moment, it's been revealed. The news is God's solution to our problem, right? That we can be saved. So don't get too excited because point A is the shortest one. Let's go to point B. Got some work to do here. Oh my, here we go. Let me read these next verses to you, please. Verse 22 of Romans chapter 3. The righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There's no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. I don't know if you had opportunity in your study of this, but uh, this passage just has big, churchy words. And some aren't real long, but they're still churchy words, right? Uh, sinned, faith, righteousness, there's a little longer one, redemption, justified, and uh, we're going to break those down and talk through those here in a little bit, but let's just look at this. The, God provides a righteousness that can only be accessed through faith by believing, and this is the only way, and it's available for everyone. God provided it. Okay, and as we've talked, and I kind of want to work off of, of, of Steve's idea last week of all-inclusive. Number one there, all-inclusive, letter A. Everyone has sinned and is under God's wrath. Everyone has sinned. And in Romans chapter 1, it talks about those that are running away from God. Do you remember how Romans chapter 1 ends? It ends with not only do they do these things, but they encourage and approve and celebrate others in doing this running away from God. And I was just thinking, these are the people that have such a, a hatred for God and a, a uh, they're the ones that are just saying, well, I just don't even want anything to do with God. Because me and all my friends, we'd just rather go party in hell. Right? Like, I don't want anything to do with God. Why would I want to go to heaven with the good people? I'd rather just, if, if I'm going to live forever, I'd rather live forever there. Oh, that's scary. That's sad. Or in the rest of Romans chapter 2, in the start of 3, the Jews are mentioned in particular but who else is under God's wrath? Who else needs to be made right with God? Well, the other category of people are those who are self-righteous. Who declare themselves to be okay with God. And for the Jews, uh, they, they were distorting their understanding of God. They were distorting their understanding of the law. And they were making it that within their own means, by their own efforts, they were meeting their own standards. 
And God's saying, no, you're not even close to the perfection, the holiness that's expected of me. And uh, that's true of all the major world religions also. All the world religions that are unique in Christianity, is it not that we need to do something and I'm sure then that God will be able to accept us? And each of those major world religions, Islam and Hinduism and all those, they have their God. It's a very distorted idea of the Christian God, but they have their God. And the people that adhere to those faiths go through all sorts of practices and rituals in hope of what? In hope of making their God happy. In hope of appeasing their God. Of hope of having a better life here or a better life to come, right? And as I think about this, this is the, the statement that came to me here. Surely a good God will accept someone who makes a good effort at being good. And that's a lie. But it's believed by lots and lots and lots of people on the face of this earth. Isn't it interesting how we're created to worship and so religions pop up all over the place and faiths pop up and this is what they hold to. They just have their own little unique quirks to them but surely a good God will accept someone who makes a good effort at being good. Sounds good, doesn't it? But Romans chapters 1, 2, and 3 tells us that we have no ability to be good, to be made right with God ourselves. Our good efforts always come up short. For all of sin, and we come short of God's expectation of what God has for us. We miss the mark there. And so, as Steve mentioned last week, it's all inclusive. Every living person is hopeless and helpless before God. And judgment for their sins is certain. And then letter B is also everyone. There's a little asterisk here with this everyone. But everyone has access to a righteousness from God. Now it's slightly different than everyone has sinned. Because that's a universal truth. It's also a universal truth that everyone can be made right with God. However... It's by faith, right? So it's available to everyone, but not everyone accepts it. Not everyone accepts it on God's terms. Does that make sense? And so, so there's a little bit of a distinction there. But in verse 22, we just read, This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. The word righteousness has to do with, with being right before God. Okay, being, being uh, accepted again. Maybe this is too simple, but we're on okay terms with God again. As opposed to God's wrath, we're now friends with God. Uh, in Romans chapter 1, verse 17, it's our memory verse that we started out, and it's the, the theme there uh, for... Uh, the book of Romans. But it says there, it's quoted from the, the book of Habakkuk, that the righteous will live by faith. Uh, I don't know if you figured this out or if you looked at some uh, various translations in your study. But the word righteous and the word just are often interchangeable. And the Greek word, the same Greek, it's the same Greek root word there for both of those. So some of your translations in uh, chapter 117 might say the just will live by faith. Some might say the righteous will live by faith. Well, what we discover is, is that as we translate into other languages, 
right? We try to come up with words, and even in our own language, the meanings of our words keep shifting and changing, right? And so what words can best describe this, that we're made right with God, the righteousness of God, or there's a justice there, a justness there, and uh, I don't know if you want to look at this, but if you just want to flip back to Romans 2.13, if you go back to Romans 2.13, this is one that uh, I discovered along the way there too. Uh, in the King James Version of Romans 2.13 and in several other versions, it says this. For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. It uses the word just and justified twice. In the NIV, I don't know if it's the 84 NIV or which, which NIV it is, but in the NIV it says, for it is not those who hear the law who are righteous in God's sight, but it is those who obey the law who will be declared righteous. Anybody discover that? It, uh, that's a neat thing to look at and to think that through. And there's some versions that will use just and then righteous, or righteous and then just in that same verse, but it's to help us to understand the concept there, right, of of being right with God, being made just, that we're okay again, that we're justified, that we stand with God okay. So if you're concerned as I go through the rest of this passage and I interchange the word justice and righteousness and just and righteousness, uh, uh, I hope you can understand that I'm just trying to help us to figure out what it, God's really saying to us. So let's look through some of these words that are in this passage. So on the next slide here, as we come to that, all are justified. All are justified. Starts out there in verse 24, right? All are justified. All people have, the, have access to being made right with God. All are justified. All can be made right with God. Uh, Maybe you've heard it said, I've heard this here recently. The word justified, maybe a simple way to remember its definition, is just as if I'd never sinned. Anybody heard that before? Just as if I'd never sinned. Yep, just as if I'd never sinned. Because what is our sin? Our sin is what separates us from God. It makes us the objects of God's wrath under his judgment. If we had never sinned, we would not have a problem, right? So it takes us to a place that, that we can't get to ourselves, but it's as if we've never sinned, that's justified. It's a legal term. It's a legal term. It's for the judge to put down the gavel and say you're acquitted, not guilty. You're free. The word justified has to do with the law, with a courtroom, with the judge, with God the Father who looks at a sinner and says you are guilty because of your sin. And as we follow through the rest of this, instead he'll be able to put down the gavel and say you're not guilty, you're acquitted. I've never been in a position in a courtroom to hear that. I've been in a position and watched as other people have heard guilty. I'm trying to think if I've ever been in a place where I've heard them say not guilty. I just know the weight of guilty and the decision has been made and it's final. We've come to that conclusion. Well, justified is you're no longer guilty. Next one, through faith. Through faith. Uh, I just need to, don't worry, Don. I'm not going to bother you. But I'm going to just borrow a chair. Because we do this when we teach our kids. And I think it works. I think it works. But faith Trust, belief are all three words that, uh, that are alluded to show up in this passage. Faith, trust, I believe. Uh, 
this chair is for sitting in. And uh, as I look at the integrity of this chair and I look at others who are sitting in this chair, uh, based upon what I know is true, based upon what I know is true, I think that if I sit in that chair, I believe it'll hold me up. I believe it'll hold me up. I notice I didn't get one of the folding chairs. <laughs> that was intentional. <laughs> but I believe that it'll hold me up. But a belief or a trust in the chair is really ineffective until one actually puts themselves in a place where they have to trust the chair. Right? To say it is one thing, but to actually sit down and, tr and, and demonstrate that I trust that it will hold me. So what's the chair? It's Jesus, right? And what's true about him and all his claims that he made? And as we go through this passage, he makes a lot of amazing claims and wonderful claims and miraculous claims. And he says, these things are all true. And lots of people might say, yes, well, I believe that that's true about Jesus. But have they actually taken themselves and by faith demonstrated their trust by saying, I let go of myself and I completely trust in Jesus. The next term that's there, number four, freely by his grace. Freely by his grace. Free, we like free. <laughs> we love free. We even will take things that aren't really good if they're free. We've put some not good things out in front of the road by our house that put free on it and they are gone. Freely by his grace. It's undeserved. It's without cost to us. Now, it costs God something, but it's without cost to us. It does not need to be earned. Grace is a gift from God to people who don't deserve it. So how can we be made righteous? How can we be justified before God? How can we have our standing with God Moved, transferred from being condemned and guilty to being acquitted. It's by faith, believing what God has done for us through Jesus, freely given to us, offered a gift. We can't earn it. God paid for it. God did it. And we don't deserve it. But that's the beauty of it. That's the beauty of it. What did all the other religions say? Well, we've worked hard at being good. We must deserve it. No, God's got it for us. And then finally, number five, through redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Through redemption that is in Christ Jesus. This has a word, justification is a legal term. This has the idea of slavery or someone who's been kidnapped. Uh, we find this often when the uh, children of Israel were enslaved by the Pharaoh of Egypt. And God redeemed them from the Pharaoh and set slaves free. And so if someone is kidnapped and you are aware that there's a cost for their, their to be set free, right? To pay a ransom. There's a cost to that. The ransom has to be paid. And if it's paid and the captor agrees with that, then they set the prisoner free. They set the slave free. And what's interesting is we read in the Bible that it's Jesus who paid the ransom and that now we who have accepted by faith his gift of salvation, his good news, belong to Jesus. And we'll get to that more in the book of Romans and there's so much more to unpack what it means to actually belong to Jesus. But this word of redemption we were slaves, and through Jesus, we have been set free. Not everyone, 
but all who have believed by faith. It's available for everyone, but not everyone accepts it. Let her see. Without Christ's death, there is no hope. Why did Christ come to this earth? Well, he did a lot of nice things. He did a lot of good things. But those things weren't fixing the big problem that we had. And the big problem is, is that God is righteous and God is holy and God is perfect and God has set the standard and we don't meet it, and we are under his wrath, and there's nothing we can do about it. And so God, who left the world, sent Jesus into the world, that whoever believes in him won't perish, but have life, be with God for all eternity. Let me just read these verses, verse 25. God presented Christ as the sacrifice of atonement. We'll get to that word here in a moment. Or propitiation, some of your translations may say. Through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness. Because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time. So as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith. In Jesus. Again, it qualifies it that this is all true for those who have faith in Jesus. So, what is true here? What's happening? How would you answer the question why did Jesus have to die on the cross? Why did he have to die? Why did Jesus have to die? Couldn't God, in his goodness, give us all another chance? Why did Jesus have to die? Why didn't God just say, well, I, I created you, I love you, and every human being that's created in my image, I, I want you all with me, so come on. And on the other side, I'll make you perfect. Why did Jesus have to die on a cross? Well, here, here's why. Let's see if we can't pull this apart a little bit. And, uh, God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement. Sacrifice of atonement. Uh, the word there is elastarion. Is that close, Greg? Elasterion. It actually means mercy seat. It means the covering to the Ark of the Covenant. And in the Old Testament, under the, under the uh, time of the, the priests and the tabernacle and the temples, once each calendar year on the Day of Atonement, the priest would offer sacrifices for his own sin, and then he would enter into the most holy place, where he would meet with God and he would bring the blood of a goat in with him and the ark was there and on top of the ark were the two cherubims and the covering was there and this is called the mercy seat and he would sprinkle and place the blood there on the mercy seat and it was a place where two things were happening. One is, is the sins of the people were being forgiven but also it was a place where God demanded that sin, the penalty of it is death. And so that goat, that sacrifice, the blood that represented the death of that goat was satisfying God. It was a sacrifice that was acceptable to God. And as we read in the Old Testament at the mercy seat, they had to do this year after year after year because it was a temporary covering, 
because we were waiting for Jesus to come to pay it in full. And this, this, this passage, we'll get to that in a minute. So what is happening at this mercy seat? Well, there's two things that are happening at this mercy th- seat. One, want a big word? Drew introduced me to this word. I'm sure I've read it in the, in the past and decided that it's too big, but I'm doing it. At the mercy seat, Jesus is our expiation. When we don't use. At the mercy seat, Jesus is our expiation. By his death, our sins are forgiven. Jesus is that mercy seat. Jesus gave his own blood in that place so that our sins could be forgiven. In Hebrews 9.26 we read, But he, Jesus, appeared once for all at the culmination of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. And then Jesus is also our propitiation. Some of your translations may have that word there instead of atonement. What's the flip side of the coin? Not only do our sins need to be forgiven, but God needs to be appeased. And propitiation is the idea that for whatever your faith is, whatever gods you have, you have to do certain things to try to make your gods happy, to get their blessing. Well, God says in his perfectness, in his justice, in his perfect character, that he just can't say, I forgive your sins. Because he established that the penalty of sin is death. And so God, just to be true to himself, to have integrity, needed to do what? He needed to have a payment for those sins, to appease himself. And so Jesus, as the mercy seat, did those two things when Jesus died and took on himself the sins of us and took God's wrath on himself. God the Father was pleased with that and our sins were forgiven. So two things are happening there. Our sins are forgiven and God is pleased. 1 Thessalonians 1.10, it says, And to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. Why are we no longer under God's wrath? Because Christ's death appeased God, pleased God, met God's demands. God could not be God if he simply canceled the debt of sin. He can't just simply say, you're forgiven. The debt had to be paid for, and humans had no possibility of ever paying that debt. So God in his love and grace made a way through the death of his son. The penalty for sin is death, and Jesus willingly came and took humanity's sin on himself and transferred his righteousness to us. Justified. We're righteous. The big exchange, and other passages in the New Testament talk about this, But Jesus took our sin. We gave him our baggage. And he gave us his righteousness. We're justified. We're made right with God. We're no longer (laughs) under condemnation. We're God's people. In 2 Corinthians 5.21, I don't know if I gave that in your notes, but you might just want to write that down. 2 Corinthians 5.21 2 Corinthians 5.21 God made him Jesus who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So how can a sinful person be made right with God? How can we get out of Romans chapters 1, 2 and the first part of 3? not our righteousness it's not our effort it's what God did he gave us Jesus to do what we couldn't do ourselves so that we could be forgiven and made right with God 
How can a holy, righteous God pardon sin? Because of the death of Jesus. Because of the death of Jesus. And Jesus' death paid for all our sins, and it's paid in full. And the last uh, verse in this, this uh, little section says that, uh, okay, not the last verse, sorry, but right in the middle of this passage, he did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. Before Christ came and died, what was going on in the Old Testament for all those years? What were all those sacrifices about? Well, Paul writes here that you know what it was about? God was waiting patiently because in his good plans, Jesus was coming to pay it in full. And when Jesus died, he paid the penalty for all sins. All the sins of those in the Old Testament and all the sins in the present time people alive and all the sins in the future, it was a sufficient penalty that was paid. It was paid in full. So in the Old Testament, when people brought their animal sacrifices, God patiently withheld his wrath. I was thinking of this. When Christ said to the paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, God withheld his wrath just a little longer. And when Christ said, as he was being nailed to the cross, Father, forgive them, Forgiveness was finally accomplished, met, when Jesus died on the cross. So all of that was God's forbearance, his patience, because it was only through Jesus. Jesus, he bore our sins and took the wrath of the Father. Sins were no longer, we might say, passed over by God, but now we're paid in full. And then these two words that show up at the very end, so as to be just and the one who justifies. I guess you could say so as to be righteous and the, the one who makes us, declares us righteous, right, righteifies. <laughs> God is just. He operates within unchanging standards of law and justice that he has established. You're guilty. And your sins deserve my wrath. But God is the one who says you can be made right. He's the one who declares that the one who believes by faith is righteous, is justified, stands before God just as if they've never sinned. No longer under condemnation, but set free. So what did God do? He did everything that we couldn't do to make a way to him. He demanded a sacrifice for sin and he offered it up. That's his mercy. Right? He provided the lamb himself for us. Genesis 22 when Abraham was offering Isaac on the altar. The angel there says, God himself will provide a lamb. He did, because he loved us. So in conclusion, we're going to end in a way that we uh, don't typically end in. But uh, David and Sarah, come on up, please. Uh, if you are here this morning... And you are a follower of Jesus and you've been justified. And you know before God that things are right with you and God because you've believed by faith. That's some of you in this room, I believe, right? So let me extend it just a moment, a little bit further. If that's you and you are a believer, a follower of God, and you would be willing this morning 
to say, I'm available to help somebody else come to know God. I'm available to pray with someone in their struggle maybe with God's goodness, with God's grace, with God's mercy. If you would be willing to do that and to help be alongside someone and taking them to God this morning, would you stand up? I mean, this is kind of like the reverse altar call, right? <laughs> but would you stand up if you're willing to do that? And that's all. We got it. Good. Thank you. Would uh, If you have some questions, if you want to pray, look around at who's standing up and say, you know what? I don't know if I've ever made things right with God. What is it that keeps us from accepting the gift? It's our pride and our arrogance. And we still think we can be good enough. And we don't want to truly submit to God and say, I want to trust you completely. And trust you completely. Right? So all of you stand, please. And while we sing this closing song, if you would like to pray with someone, if you would like to come and pray with me, would you just tap somebody that was standing there near you on the shoulder and say, come pray with me. And you can just walk to the back or to the side or out in the hallway in the back. This is your opportunity to be made right with God. Don't miss it.